The regular season is down to the final few weeks and the playoffs are on everyone's mind. Two featured games show that intensity is growing to a fever pitch. And some special kids get to spend quality time with members of one team. All that and more right now on ECHL Week. Hi and welcome to ECHL Week. With just three weeks left in the regular season, playoff races in both conferences are in full swing. In the West, it's about seeding and figuring out the first round matchups for the 2014 Kelly Cup playoffs. In the East, it's about six teams trying to grab one of the last four playoff berths. Although there are other possibilities, at this point in the Eastern Conference, it looks as if the home ice advantages in the first round will belong to Reading, Kalamazoo, South Carolina, and Orlando, and all four are starting to pass, or stay ahead of, as many of the others as possible. Because statistically speaking, home ice advantage doesn't mean that much in the playoffs, but if it comes down to Game 7, everyone would rather play that one at home. And considering that every playoff series is a best of seven matchup, you just know that there will be some of those Game 7s along the line. The hottest teams recently? Reading at 12-3-1 in its last 16, and Kalamazoo with a 17-3-2 mark in its last 22. Those two teams meet twice in Reading in the second last weekend of the season. The rest of the Eastern standings change on an almost daily basis, although Greenville, on a 15-3 run, seems as if it's hitting its peak at just the right time. Factors that could make a difference? How about where the games are played? Evansville finishes its schedule with eight straight on the road, where it's four games under 500. And Florida finishes its season with nine in a row at home, although the Everblades have struggled in Estero and are actually a game under par at Germain Arena. Also, Wheeling has six home games left in the final three weeks. So if either the Everblades or Nailers can take advantage of that home cooking, they can wrap up one of those postseason spots. Speaking of the Nailers, we had a chance to catch up with their coach and captain recently, and they talked about this stretch run for the playoffs. Our, our team uh, is on a little bit of a roll here right now, but uh, we're playing well. We're managing the puck. Uh, we're playing good, solid defense, team defense, which is creating offense for us, and uh, we're getting good goaltending. But uh, we have a long way to go here. Uh, it's a tough stretch, and uh, we got to play some good teams. Yeah, I think that's what it's all about, is uh, coming together at the right time. And uh, right now, uh, we're a confident group in there, and uh, we're looking forward to playoffs starting here. You know, we, we want to be in control of our own destiny, and we got to go out and win each period. So we break it down into periods, even if we have to in five games, five minute segments. So, but we have a lot of rookies on our team, a lot of young guys, first time going through this. But our veterans have been very good in, in helping the rookies out and not getting them to look too far. Just, you know, stay in the moment here, have good shifts, try to have 20, 25 good shifts in every game, no bad ones, and uh, try to go out there and win each period. We got a good group of vets in there, and we also got a lot of young legs in our locker room that are really stepping up lately. Uh, you know, guys like Cody Sylvester, he's rolling right now. Carter Rowney, that whole line, Sahir Gill, I mean, all those guys are really contributing right now, and uh, we have a good mix of guys in there. Cincinnati made it to the Eastern Playoff Finals last season. As the highest scoring team in the East, the Cyclones had the firepower to go at least that far again this year. Let's take a look at some of that offense as the Clones host Elmira. After a pair of Penguins kind of make the ceremonial puck drop, here are Nick Brunker and Dave Allen to call this very spirited game for us on the Cyclones Radio Network. Five minutes gone by, period one. Cyclones and Jackals scoreless. A chance side of the net. Conway got knocked off the puck. Back to the line it goes. Wristed on, directed again. Save is made. And they score! A rebound came out. And the Cyclones cash in. And his backhand pass is cut off. Down the left wing boards they go. The Jackals with Corey Bellamy, three on one forming. Across the middle and they score. It didn't take long. We'll see if there will be any additional minors as a result of the early throwdown. The fight happens at the center of the Cyclone blue line. Young gets a couple of quick shots on, and Dalhusen then rolls on top, but not before the linesmen come in to separate. A bout that lasted about five seconds. Missed it by that, that much. much. 4.30 to go in the first. The save made, and the rebound scores! Right off the faceoff. By Bushbacher, and it's taken off the backboards for a moment by Petrus, but turned over. Nice job again for Bushbacher at the side of the net. Jammed that, and at the side of the post, for another two seconds before the whistle comes, we're going to see another fight here potentially. As Bushbacher does not take kindly to the 
shoving match in front. He drops the mitts, and Dame Walters is tied up against the end boards and gets thrown down to the ice with two minutes to play. Loose puck away from Crowder, but Crowder doing a great job keeping it on his forehand. Now backhand, trying to get it out in front for Nugent, but it's peeled off the stick, and a huge oh. hip check at center. Sends Rob Bellamy down, and now we're going to have ourselves a scrap again. O'Keefe who laid that hip check, is going to meet Petrus between the Cincinnati circles. A couple of big right-handed swats, and now as O'Keefe gets back to his feet, throws a heavy right-hand hooker cut there, and the two are going to fall down, and the fight is over. As they battle further, one minute into this second period from U.S. Bank Arena, 2-1 Cincy. Big drive, in the air, hits a careen off a stick, and then down right to Koger, who slams it inside. Nugent just at the hash mark, reversing. And as the Cyclones try to set up at center, a headband pass right onto Shala is tagged and passed across for Nugent. Nice move to the front, and a save is made by Conway, and they score on the rebound! Two period number two from downtown Cincy. Jackals trying to get the equalizer again. Wristed, and they score from the right side point, creeping towards the middle by Pakalik. Puck is loose and then picked up very quickly by Nugent again. Cyclone still maintained the puck. Here's Nugent again. Backhander and he scores! Talk about a single-handed effort. What a move. What a play. Cincinnati 4-3 leaders. Trying to hear those tonight. Again, CyclonesHockey.com. Center point. It's Crow. Snapping one towards the net. They score! Josh Burkholz. No drag was a beauty. But unfortunately, the block shot will negate the opportunity. Between the circles, scores! Patrick Brian Nugent! The teams have had in this hockey game. At the center point, it's Aronson. Slid over to Fraze. Off the boards, he watched it bounce. Played it back again to Aronson, but between the circles, Aronson going to have to get on his horse. Petra steals it. He's going to go in on a breakaway, and he scores. A shorthanded goal. No urgency at all in the Jackal power play. They didn't register a single shot on goal. 43-19 to in that department. Shot and they score. And Colin Jacobs right in front of the slot. As regulation winds down, Cyclones hoping they can hit the empty net. Knifed out to Shala. Tries to get it out but can't. At the right point, given away again. As McDonald will pick it up. Pass it nicely right to the center line. And from the center line, it's very from Brian Nugent. A four-goal night. I think uh, just my line mates give me a lot of opportunities and um, yeah, I, I got set up with a lot of good chances and fortunately uh, Pucks went in the net tonight. A Western Conference battle on the ice and one off the ice when ECHL Week continues. Stars shine in Orlando in January of 2015 when the Solar Bears take on the ECHL All-Stars at the Amway Center, presented by Visit Orlando. Visit OrlandoSolarBearsHockey.com for more information. 25 years of great moments. More than 500 players graduated to the NHL. Don't miss the next time hockey history is made. Watch all ECHL games on AmericaOneSports.com. Live or on demand. At home or on your mobile device, log in at AmericaOneSports.com to check out your favorite team. The official broadband broadcast of ECHL is AmericaOneSports.com. Where have hundreds of NHL players gotten their professional starts? The ECHL. And where do you find out about the ECHL? ECHL Week. On television or online. ECHL Week is the only show that brings you everything that's happening league-wide. Every week, watch ECHL Week. If you were any closer to the action, you'd be in the lineup.
Bakersfield is trying to catch Stockton for sixth place and avoid Ontario and Alaska in the first round of the Western Conference playoffs. Las Vegas is locked into playing the West's top seed as its first round opponent. Let's see if either team looks playoff ready. Handling the announcing duties for us are Ryan Holt and Kevin Bartle on Fox Sports Radio 970. Watson forced the puck free. Watson top of the crease. Miller shoots and scores! You always look at benchmarks as the season goes on, and now Adam Huxley and Andrew Carroll, for the fourth time this season, will drop the mitts in the end. Waiting to square up here. They're at the Condors' blue line. Carroll's 14th fight of the year over the top on the right. Huxley can't get one off. This is Huxley's second fight in as many games. They lock horns. Huxley missed with a right, missed with a jab. Carroll came over the top on the right. Huxley, a couple of rabid punches to the back of Carroll's head. Carroll's still looking to get the right arm free. Carroll's still holding on. Huxley can't get much off. This is just a battle of wills here at center ice. Huxley with a quick jab. Carroll's still holding on, looking to get the right free still. Carroll still bear hugging Huxley. Huxley missed with an uppercut. Carroll looking to get that arm free still. Huxley has a good grab on it. Carroll just won't let go. Carroll still holding on. Still looking to get the right free. The linesman want to step in, but Carroll has yet to get that right free and start wailing away. He's still holding on as Huxley missed with another right. Huxley dance. Now Carroll missed with a left. They're still holding on here as this fight's taking forever. Carroll still holding on. Now a left from Carroll. That one connected on the chin. Carroll still holding on, and now the linesman will step in. Over a 19% clip here this year. The Wranglers fourth for their last 25 over the last the five games. Puck ribbed around, but Del Grosso will hold right point. Del Grosso center holding. Five left circle for Armstrong. Three high here for the Wranglers. Straight across the blue line. Wrist shot in front off the blocker and glove of Laurent Brassois. It rolls right wing corner. Left half towards Armstrong center point. Del Grosso steps in and one scores. 12.42 left in the second, and the Wranglers' power play cashes in. Completely turned this game on its head. Neutral zone, Miller avoided two checks and still worked the puck free on the right half boards for Chris Collins. Collins was bottled up there, still worked it back. Center point, Hughes. Hughes walking in, looking, holding, backdoor feed, shoots and scores! Rookie to rookie, Hughes to Miller, and the Condors back in front. On Joe Marciano. Minute remaining, second period. Michael O'Neill trying to get it back to the point. Pokovich was spun around. He's hurt back behind the play. It's rimmed all the way down. Brassois will come out to play it. Pokovich in a world of hurt here, skating off on one leg behind the play. Finucci turned it over. Condors come away with it. Here's Thurber out to center. Las Vegas looking for a whistle. And they're not going to get one. Haywood drops it off left half wall. Class in front. Thurber knocked around. The kid scores! <laughs> Held in left point. Colburn wrist shot. Sticked away by Brassois. Puckle on the back wall, nearing in front. Stuff shot scores! Robbie Smith, top of the crease. This one's not over. The Wranglers get a power play tally. Fell on top of it. Five seconds left. It kicks out to the blue line, out to center ice. Time will run out. The Condors win it 3 2. It was the rookies tonight. Greg Miller with two. Nick McNeil is first as a pro. Let's get to a few other stories of interest from around the league. Not only do the Ontario Reign and Bakersfield Condors compete in the ECHL's Pacific Division, now the two rivals have agreed to another contest, this time in an attempt to conserve water. The Reign, Condors, their respective arenas, and the company which manages both facilities are having a month-long competition during which the arena with the least water use on a per-fan basis will emerge victorious. This is particularly significant because many parts of California are dealing with drought conditions. The end of the contest is on Earth Day, April 22nd, and it will likely be a home playoff game for the rain. And it's possible their opponent that night could be the Condors. What about the stakes? If Bakersfield wins, the rain will hand over a gift box from the Graber Olive House, the oldest existing business in Ontario. If the rain wins, the Condors will send a box of baby carrots from Bakersfield-based Grimway Farms to Orange County. Here's the uh, best part. 
the losing team will not be allowed to shower after their game closes to April 22nd, which will also help in water conservation efforts. When Utah topped Idaho at a recent game, over 9,000 fans, the second largest crowd of the season, were in attendance for military night. After the Grizzlies' victory was the team's post-game auction of military-themed camouflage jerseys, which featured the names of Utah season ticket holders who have served in the military on the front. During the evening, $16,250 was raised for Fisher House to provide housing for wounded service personnel and their families upon returning home from overseas duty. The Colorado Eagles, with the help of the Sheriff's Departments of both Larimer and Weld Counties and Lucky Joe's, a local business, managed to collect over $41,000 for Wesley Martin and his family in the Eagles' third annual Pot of Gold fundraiser. The 10-year-old Martin, who's from Greeley, Colorado, was diagnosed with a cyst on his brain as an infant. The cyst has grown to a point where it's now the size of a grapefruit. Martin needs a specialized surgery later this year, and it's not covered by his family's medical insurance. When the Eagles learned about Wesley's situation, they and their arena full of fans stepped in to help. Considering about $200,000 is needed, the money raised by the Eagles and their followers will go a long way toward helping the Martins reach that goal. A question about face-offs, plus an outdoor practice. Up next on ECHL Week. I'm Kevin Young from the Colorado Eagles and you're watching ECHL Week. So our question today, Joe, is what are the criteria that linesmen use to throw a center out of a face-off circle, out of the face-off circle? Well, one of the uh, scenarios would be if the uh, centerman would be uh, not putting a stick down. Um, the other would be um, if he jumped, obviously after a stick was down. Um, another would be from uh, a winger encroaching on the backside of, uh, of the faceoff. So when that happens, then is there a possibility that uh, if that happens a second time, there's another penalty for that, isn't there? Yeah, there's a penalty for that. Uh, we don't usually have one. Uh, the linesmen are very good about getting the second faceoff down, but there is a penalty, yes, for that. Talk about um, training linesmen to actually do face-offs. It seems from the casual observer that he's there, he drops the puck, and the play starts. It, there's got to be a little more to it than that, though. Well, there is. There's obviously communication with the centerman, uh, making sure the visiting team goes down first, then the home team comes down, um, and, and not missing what we call the window. You know, when you get a guy down and then the other, the uh, home team is coming down with the stick, you can't sit there and wait and hesitate and everything else because you're going to have not only the centerman jumping, but you're also going to have the wingers jumping and uh, you're going to be throwing guys out for that. So get it down, get it down, make it fair. That's our question and answer session with Joe Ernst, Vice President of Hockey Operations for the ECHL. Would you like Joe to answer one of your questions? Send us an email and we'll pose it to him as time permits. Send your question to ECHL Week at ECHL.com. Make sure to include your name, hometown, and your favorite ECHL team. During the course of a 72-game season, sometimes non-game day routines can get a bit tedious. The Alaska Aces found a way around this earlier in the season. They moved practice outdoors. Let's take a look and hear the reactions of some team members on a chilly morning in Anchorage. Hey, 
just to have some fun and, and uh, you know, the guys deserve it. Yeah, I've been doing well lately, so uh, that's basically what we did. I wish I would have had a little stocking cap on. Really remind me of being home. You know, we can come out and have some fun and uh, you know get together. We got a lot of guys injured, so it's one of those things where it's, we can have fun, but uh, you know, still keeping the hockey mindset. A lot of people are giving 100 percent out there. There's a lot of effort. Sometimes maybe a little too much. Lou, Lou is running around. Uh, Davies is going hard. James Martin always giving 110 percent. The Peter Klima bucket? I don't know. It's comfortable. It doesn't look good, but. Uh, I'm not really concerned with that at this point. It's easy to find me on the ice. Maybe I get more pucks if that helps. I didn't thought of that benefit, but we'll take that if it comes. That is something else. I don't. I don't even. I don't think they make those. I know they don't because uh, that's not concussion proof or anything like that. But that's that's uh, that's a good bucket. Zachary's my older son. He's a bigger kid, and then uh, Brendan's my younger younger boy. Asked to come to the the rink with me this morning, and I told him that uh, to bring their gear and. Uh, they could play with us uh, out, out on the outdoor ring. Well, this is awesome. This is uh, going out and skating until your hands are cold, your feet, you can't feel them anymore. So it's fun. really reminds me of being back in Minnesota. Frostbites poses some interesting questions to members of one South Division team. Straight ahead on ECHL Week. Now it's time to go behind the scenes in an informal manner with some members of the Florida Everblades in today's Frostbites. Who's, who's the best dressed guy on the team? Oh, that's got to be Jordan Henry for sure. He's, uh, he's always looking, looking sharp and dapper. Um, we got a few guys with some really nice style. John Henry on. He's always looking, uh, looking top notch. Jordan Henry, no doubt. That guy is unbelievably stylish. He puts us all the shape. He's got the, you know, the bright colored pants and the fancy shirts and you know, he's a well-dressed guy. So we all kind of try to model ourselves after him, but come up short. If you ask him, would he give you tips or are you, are you pretty much on your own? I, you know, I've never been the type to walk up and ask another guy for fashion tips. It's just not <laughs> something I've, I've wanted to do. Jordan Henry, that guy, I think, uh, you know, takes his pages out of the GQ book all the time. So, uh, no, he's definitely the best dressed team, uh, best dressed player in the team uh, by far, probably. He gave credit for that to his fiance. Does that does that make sense? Uh, probably odds are, because I don't think it comes from him. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think anyone wants to look good wherever they go, but I don't know about best dress on the team. I feel like the guys just like to give me a hard time about that. Who uh, controls the music in the locker room uh, before the game and all that kind of stuff? Who, who's in charge of that? Yeah, I think the DJ this year is uh, Matt Bissoli. Uh, he loves uh, every kind of music, uh, so I think that's, uh, that's him, yeah, Bissoli. Does he get a, does he get pretty good feedback? Do the guys like it all right, or they don't complain too much? No, we don't complain, but I think it's time for him to change his, uh, his city right now. When they're not playing, practicing, or traveling, ECHL team members are often in public talking about hockey and helping to make their communities better places to live. Let's take a look at what the South Carolina Stingrays have been up to. South Carolina forwards Patrick Gall and Igor Gongalski, along with defenseman Jeremy Price and Steve Spinell, and team president Rob Concanon, recently made an appearance and played a little bit of floor hockey with students and teachers at Pattison's Academy. Pattison's is a facility that provides educational and rehabilitation programs for children with multiple disabilities in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. The school operates a therapeutic summer camp, 
a charter school, and also offers family support programs as well as therapy services to other schools and homebound children. Here's a look at some of the activities from that busy day. Time to wrap up another program. Thanks for joining us, and don't forget to stay connected with us. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and you can always email us too. See you next time. Until then, make it a good week. Make it an ECHL week.